Thank you, Eliza, and good morning, everyone. I am the Reverend Joan Javier Duval, Minister of the Unitarian Church of Montpelier, and I begin our call to worship with these words from Angela Ogantala. When it comes to our futures, we have hope, we have fear, but sometimes we forget that we also have influence, and that means we can choose the futures we want to work towards. Nothing is written in stone. Here, let us remember our hopes that they might grow and attend to our fears that they might diminish. Let us remember our own agency and influence so that our hearts grow bolder. Let us cast our vision for a future that is worthy of our dreams and let us commit to partnering with one another to work towards that vision, knowing that all we do now shapes what is yet to come. Come, let us worship together. Good morning. Our opening song is from the Gray Hymnal, number 126, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And in honor of our theme of imagination, uh, we will be tweaking the rhythm a little bit. It's normally kind of short, short, long, long, short, short, long, long, but the long, long part's going to be syncopated. Short, short, long, long, bum, 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 bum. So please join me and we're... Come thou fount of every blessing, tune our hearts to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. While the hope of life's perfection fills our hearts with joy and love, teach us ever to be faithful, may we still thy goodness prove. Come thou fount of every vision, lift our eyes to what may come. See the lion and the young lamb dwell together in thy home. Hear the cries of poor false island, feel our love glow like the sun. When we all serve one another, then our heaven is begun. Come thou fount of inspiration, turn our lives to higher ways. Lift our gloom and desperation, show the promise of this day. Help us find ourselves in you, help our hands tell of our love. With thine aid, O fount of justice, earth be fair as heaven above. Earth be fair as, earth be fair as, earth be fair as, heaven above. 
Let us now light the chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. If you have a chalice nearby, I invite you to light yours with me. We light this flame, enduring symbol of our collective commitment to lead with truth and compassion. Now let us say in unison our affirmation adapted from Universalist Minister L. Griswold Williams. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve human need, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine, thus do we covenant. Good morning, everyone. My name is Liza Earl Centers. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm so excited for worship this morning. If you have any children in the house who might like to be here for this time for all ages, we will be talking about a talented young person like each of them is. In worship today, we ask the question of how you make a dream for a better world actually come true. Let's see what's in the wonder box today and maybe that can help us. I'm shaking it and I'm not hearing a sound. Inside, they're very small. I don't know if you can see them, but there are some words here. And I could put them together in different ways. I've been thinking this week about how words can be so small and so quiet on a page, and yet they can have the power to change the world. Like the speech that we heard last week of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And this past week, we heard a lot of amazing speeches with welcoming President Biden and Vice President Harris. And I don't know about any of you, but I was very moved by one in particular by our National Youth Poet Laureate, Amanda Gorman. Raise your hand if any of you heard her poem. She recited The Hill We Climb and it has filled people around the world with new hope and love for a better world. And I want to share a few of her ideas for how we can make our dreams come true. There is Amanda. And she spoke her words so calmly and so clearly, it might be tempting to think she's just a lucky person with gifts from the heavens. Poems just come to her and she just opens her mouth and the words come out easily, right? But the truth is we could all learn a lot from Amanda because it's not magic. One of the things that Amanda has done is she has perseverance. She works really hard and doesn't give up just because something might be difficult or she's not good at it right away. She and her twin sister were raised by a single mom who sounds amazing by the way, like so many single parents are. Her mom was an English teacher, is an English teacher. And when Amanda was in kindergarten, she found out that she had something called auditory processing disorder. Basically, Amanda can hear okay, but then her brain sometimes scrambles the words so that they're harder for her to understand. And she also had a hard time speaking certain sounds like R's, for example and she felt embarrassed at times. She got special help at school with those things and she worked really hard to say words correctly. In fact, she worked so closely with words that she fell in love with them and their sounds and their rhythms. And this gave her the next thing that she really needed to make her dream come true. It gave her a passion and a love for words. She loved words more than just about anything else and wanted to use them to add beauty to the world. She was slow to learn to read, but
but once she did, it was nearly all that Amanda wanted to do. In third grade, her teacher read the class a poem that made Amanda want to write poems. Her mom, as an English teacher, limited the screen time that she and her sister had. Maybe that sounds familiar to some of you kids or teenagers listening, but it seems to be one key to her success. Amanda happily filled the hours with time, reading and writing. She says she gets ideas from reading the words of other poets and also just regular kid books too. She is still a big Harry Potter fan, like some of you are as well. And for all of you wanting to get really good at something, part of making a dream actually happen is finding others who have the same interests. As a teenager, Amanda joined a program for teenage girls who want to write. She got a mentor. A mentor is someone who helps guide you in something that you're learning. And for two years, Amanda met with this mentor, Michelle, each Wednesday after school at a cafe near her high school. They would have coffee cake and drink hot chocolate and do writing practice together, different exercises. Amanda even did workshops on the weekends and in her free time. Here's a picture of some of the girls like Amanda who take extra classes to become better writers. And practice. Amanda says she tries to write for at least 15 minutes a day, sometimes a lot more. Even if sometimes all that she can start with is writing the alphabet, she believes in writing a little bit each day. Amanda also says that when you're going after your dream, be open to those who tell you how you could do better and give you good advice, but don't be open to the ones who tell you to quit. She says over and over again, you'll be told that you won't make money. You won't make a difference. But Amanda says that doesn't matter, that if you love doing it, that is enough. For several years, Amanda has been the National Youth Poet Laureate, which means she gets to share her poems around the country. And now she helps young writers find their words. And there are more and more Amandas around this world and more of them are getting the microphone. She was invited to recite the poem at the inauguration about one month ago. And when she did, she went to work, she researched, Others, she read the works of poets at past inaugurations, and she read what others have said at times when our nation has felt very divided. So Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, Robert Frost, Maya Angelou. And then she went back to her own strong voice. And with all that passion and all that perseverance, with the support of those who helped along the way, Amanda has inspired the world. If you haven't seen her recitation of her poem, I encourage you to do so this week. And Amanda's other dream is to become president in 2036. That is the first year that she will be old enough to run. And any kindergartners who are listening that will be your first chance to vote in a presidential election. So maybe you can help make Amanda's dream come true. But until then, we each have our own gifts to think about. And whether your gift to the world is words, or maybe it is music, maybe it is experiments in science or drawing, just remember Amanda's recipe of perseverance, passion, and practice, and you're well on your way. Thanks so much. Back in 1994, um, I wrote the music to the prayer of St. Francis. Uh, it was a request to go along with the service that we had of the blessing of the animals in October. Um, and I'm very happy to be able to sing this for you today.
Make me an instrument of thy peace, an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, love. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, Make me an instrument of thy peace, an instrument of thy peace. Grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by giving that one receives, by forgiving that one is forgiven, and by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Make me an instrument of thy peace, an instrument of thy peace. I invite you now into a time of prayer and meditation, a time to tune into the condition of your own heart, to open yourself to the connection to each and every person gathered across distance and location into this shared time of worship. Time to connect to all that is beyond yourself. And we acknowledge that during this time of prayer, we acknowledge the many sources of joy and sorrow that may be present in our community today. The personal challenges of health, physical, mental, and emotional, the difficult or broken relationships, the personal losses and grief, we lift up the joy and gratitude of celebrations of births and milestones and achievements within our community. And I share with you a reminder that we have a lay pastoral caregiver available each Sunday to offer you a listening ear after the service. And today's lay pastoral caregiver is Ruth Witte. Ruth will be sharing her phone number in the Zoom chat. If you have a personal joy or concern that you'd like for others to know about this morning, you can share that now by typing it into the chat on Zoom or into the Facebook comments if you're watching along on Facebook at this time. Let us share in a few deep breaths as those words appear and we hold with care all that is being shared. May each and every one of you know that there is a love holding you and us in this time and at all times. On Tuesday evening, churches across the country, including ours, rang their bells in remembrance of the now over 400,000 lives lost to COVID-19 in the United States since the start of the pandemic. 
As we enter into a time of quiet meditation, I invite you to listen to these bells ringing at Unitarian Universalist congregations across the country, to be present to the grief that may reside in your heart, to feel the collective loss as we honor the fragility and sacredness of our humanity. And after listening to and seeing this video, we will share in a minute or two of silence.
This morning, I want to share with you about another writer who has had an influence on many people in a similar way that Amanda Gorman has. And that writer is Octavia E. Butler. As a young girl growing up in Pasadena, California, Octavia Butler would spend hours reading and dreaming up stories she was an only child and also shy and socially awkward. And so this was a way that she could keep herself entertained and also keep herself company. At the age of 10, she realized that she was starting to forget some of the stories that had been living in her head since she was a young child. And so she began to write them down. And one day as she wrote in a half used notebook, her mother came by and asked her what she was doing. And when she told her, her mother said, oh, maybe you'll be a writer. And this was a revelation to Butler. At this point, she was being raised by her grandmother and mother. This was the 1950s. Her mother worked as a maid and her father, who had died when she was seven years old, had worked as a shoe shiner. With those simple words from her mother, maybe you'll be a writer, she realized this was something people did for a living, and she began on her path. I'll show you in case you're not familiar with Octavia Butler. Here's a, here's a picture of her. I first discovered Octavia Butler's writing in my early 20s when I was part of a book group with other women of color in Washington, D.C., who also happened to be progressive activists. And we shared suggestions with one another of the books that we might want to read together. And it turns out we had an overwhelming interest in social change theory, political science, fiction, and gender studies. To give you a sense of our tastes, I'll tell you that one of the first books that we read together was a comparative analysis of the philosophies of Friedrich Nietzsche and Michel Foucault. A little highbrow. <laughs> we liked a good challenge. Another book that we read together early on was Octavia Butler's Wild Seed. This is a copy of it, the copy that I actually read back then. Wild Seed is the story of two African characters, Doro and Anyanwu, who each have supernatural powers. Both are immortal. Doro is able to take over other people's bodies and to destroy anyone and anything in his path. Anyanwu has the power of healing and can transform herself into any human being as well as any animal. She is a shape shifter. The book unfolds as Doro seeks to continue breeding a race of superhumans, and he and Anyanwu struggle over the ways that they use their powers. This was my first introduction to Butler's brand of science fiction, which was especially interested in creating black female protagonists and in exploring real world power structures and dynamics 
through the imaginary worlds that she created. Butler was an early pillar in the artistic subgenre called Afrofuturism and a guiding mentor up until her death in 2006. There was renewed interest in Butler's writing over the last four years. People looked to novels to try to understand the times that we were living through and that we're living through now. George Orwell's 1984 and Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale both experienced a resurgence in sales. But for many, it was Butler's parable series, The Parable of the Sower and The Parable of the Talents, that showed uncanny prescience, including a presidential candidate with Christian fundamentalist leanings who sought to restore American power and used the slogan, Make America Great Again. Some have described Butler's writing as being about much more than fiction. Her beliefs about the nature of humanity and the universe and God are so strong that they come through in her writing as theology. One belief that is apparent in Butler's writing is in the ultimate reality of change and our human agency to affect change. This belief is encapsulated in the opening lines of her 1993 novel, Parable of the Sower. All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. These words are at the heart of a religion called Earth Seed, developed by the main character of the novel, 15-year-old Lauren Olamina. Lauren develops this new religion as a response to the dire times that she and her community are facing. It is the year 2024, not too far into the future for us at this point in time. Global warming has caused devastating effects on the planet, drought as well as rising seawater, People live in gated communities, so fearful are they of their neighbors with guns. Government services are failing. It is a grim vision of the future, written as it was 30-some years ago, and looking forward to what is now nearly the present. Unlike in some of her earlier novels, such as Wild Seed, there are no supernatural beings that use their powers to shape the world and the universe to their liking. Into this landscape, Butler places a set of human characters who must navigate the world they find themselves in with all of its troubles and challenges. They face losses and harm done to them by others. They use their skills to help one another. They become a community through trial and error and through a fundamental belief in the, net, in the nature of life as change. Butler's writing has been a source of inspiration for those seeking to create social change and to bring forth more liberatory realities for people of all ages, races, genders, and class backgrounds. Two such people are Adrian Marie Brown and Walida Imarisha. Brown is an activist, educator, and doula living in Detroit, and Imarisha is an assistant professor of Black Studies and also a writer and spoken word artist in Oregon. And together they edited a book called Octavia's Brood that sought to bring forward another subgenre of science fiction called visionary fiction. They write, visionary fiction encompasses all of the fantastic with the arc always bending toward justice. And for them, unshackling the imagination is a necessary part of bending the arc toward justice. Once the imagination is unshackled, liberation is limitless. In the book, Walida and Marisha asks, are we brave enough to imagine beyond the boundaries of the real and then do the hard work of sculpting reality from our dreams. 
I believe that this is an immensely important question for this moment. And not only are we brave enough, but where do we find the tools to do this sculpting? One answer, I think, lies in Octavia Butler's approach to her own writing career. And let me point out that Butler's career was quite remarkable. She was one of the first African-American writers in the genre of science fiction. She was the first science fiction writer to be awarded the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. She was hailed as the mother of Afrofuturism and won the Penn American Center Lifetime Achievement Award in writing. Yet she also maintained throughout her life a sense of herself as that shy and unsure girl who would hide herself in her big pink notebook. There, she once wrote, I could be a magic horse, a Martian, a telepath. There I could be anywhere but here, any time but now, with any people but these. To overcome this habit of withdrawing inward and seeing herself as less than, Butler developed a practice of writing herself notes to give herself encouragement and affirmation. One of the notes that she wrote to herself in 1975 read, This is my life. I write best-selling novels. My novels go on to the best-seller lists on or shortly after publication. My novels each travel up to the top of the bestseller lists and they reach the top and they stay on top for months. Each of my novels does this. So be it. I will find the way to do this. See to it. So be it. See to it. What a powerful use of imagination to initiate that sculpting of reality to the dream that she held for herself. But Butler's imagination didn't stop there. She also wrote, my books will be read by millions of people. I will buy a beautiful home in an excellent neighborhood. I will send poor black youngsters to Clarion or other writers workshops. I will help poor black youngsters broaden their horizons. I will help poor black youngsters go to college. I will get the best of healthcare for my mother and myself. I will hire a car whenever I want or need to. I will travel, travel whenever and wherever in the world that I choose. My books will be read by millions of people. So be it, see to it. Butler also dreamed that her own success could help her to help others, as we heard in her notes, and her imagination didn't stop at her own personal achievements. We know from her life that Octavia Butler did, in fact, become a best-selling author as well as a mentor to others, and she worked hard to make her dreams a reality. She used, I'm sure, similar processes to what Liza outlined in our story for all ages, putting forth a lot of passion and perseverance and hard work. And I find these lines in her note so compelling. So be it, see to it. With these lines, Butler brings forward prayer and incantation. She brings forward her own agency and power. Perhaps one could even call this magic and not the kind of magic that has to do with pulling rabbits out of a hat or making people disappear and then reappear. Unitarian Universalist minister Victoria Stafford describes it this way. Magic is a mix of will and intention, courage and hope, imagination which flashes out of nowhere or nothing we can name except perhaps in retrospect. In this alchemy of our hopes and dreams and the power of our will and intention is a kind of magic, a coming forth of a reality that may be difficult to explain or seemingly impossible to have come true. Victoria Stafford also stresses that these magical powers do not exist in isolation. She continues, 
our own magical powers to transform our lives or heal the world or help a friend are always, always strengthened in community. I believe that much of our getting through this pandemic over the last 10 plus months has been magical. It has taken radical imagining to re-envision school and church and theater and family holidays. A year ago, many of us couldn't have dreamed of this Zoom church or a virtual holiday fair concert or setting a place for your laptop at the Thanksgiving table to video chat with loved ones for the breaking of bread together. There are those of you who are now speaking more regularly with far-flung family than you ever did pre-COVID as you have set intentions for staying connected or repairing relationships. Some of you have faced major illnesses and the death of dear loved ones, and with determination, courage, hopes for better days, and lots of help from friends, have slogged through medical appointments and treatment and buried loved ones. Of course, there has been loss and struggle, and there is still more to come, even as we begin to see a light at the end of the tunnel. But let us not forget the magic of this time. That is, what our intention, our will, our courage, and our imaginations have made possible in the mess and the grief of it all. With this kind of magic, we can imagine beyond the boundaries of the present day and sculpt reality to our dreams. I invite you to connect with your own imagination now for a few moments. What is it that you imagine for yourself, for your loved ones, for our world in the coming days, weeks, and even years ahead? Maybe like inaugural poet Amanda Gorman, you envision a world where we never again sow division or where we lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. Maybe you're imagining what that first meal will be when you get to invite over your neighbor or your best friend. Perhaps you can envision an earth that isn't experiencing the volatility of climate change, but a stability and sustainability of species and landscapes. I invite you to share in the chat a phrase or a sentence that expresses your vision, the radical imagining of your dreams. I will read as many of these as I can, and I invite you in response to say with me the words of Octavia Butler, so be it, see to it. So I invite you as you're feeling moved to type into the chat that radical imagining that you're holding, that you're bringing forth and dreaming into the world. I'll also look over at the Facebook comments and see if anyone has anything to share there. And again, I'll read a line and then invite you to join me in saying, so, so be it, see to it. So, Hugging lots of people, so be it, see to it. Physical, emotional, spiritual movement and freedom, so be it, see to it. A Congress that works together in harmony, so be it, see to it. Singing again at our UCM community lunch, so be it, see to it. Hugging my mother, so be it, see to it. Passing legislation for the better welfare of all, so be it, see to it. A world of peace and justice, so be it, see to it. The eradication of all voter suppression laws and practices, so be it, see to it. Real hugs to family and friends, being able to give real things back to the world. 
so be it. See to it. Healthy connections, so be it. See to it. Game night with friends and staying well connected with the whole family, so be it. See to it. Love and justice, respect, systems of community care, protection and support, one without police. So be it, see to it. A world of sharing, peace and love, surrounded by strangers in a museum. So be it, see to it. A world where opposing points of view listen to each other. So be it, see to it. I'm going to read one last one. You all are filling up the chat with amazing intentions. Lasting connection to and care for the natural world. So be it, see to it. And so, dear ones, let us go with the wisdom and the courage to dream it and to see to it. And now I invite Paula Gills to lead us in our closing song. And as we draw our service to a close, we extinguish the chalice and carry with in, within each of us its healing flame, the warmth of our community, and the spark of hope and love into the days and the week ahead. As we do so, let us join in saying the mission statement of this church. We welcome all as we build a loving community to nurture each person's spiritual journey, serve human need, and protect the earth, our home. One more step, we will take one.